Hey, everybody. Hey. Can I, can I unplug this and walk around like a, like a stand-up comic, which is always the job I thought I would have if the software engineering didn't? That's a no. Okay. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a no for me, dog. Um, hey, thank you all so much for being here. This is awesome. This is my first time at Emberfest and my first time in Amsterdam. And this turnout is, is amazing. This venue is so cool. Um, I've really been enjoying Amsterdam from inside my Radisson Blue room for the last 24 hours working on these slides. Uh, but from what I can see out the window, it looks beautiful. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so thank you all for being here. It really is a, an honor to be the, the first um, to welcome you to Emberfest. Um, so for, for the purposes of this talk, I want us to all hop into a time machine. And we're going to travel into the future, but, but not too, too far into the future. Maybe, I don't know, like nine months from now, somewhere in the middle of 2019. And I want to imagine what happens in our time machine when we make a new Ember app. Well, the first thing we'll get is this clean, modern file structure, something that lets us group our files by the topic and not just by the type of thing they are. I'm sure anyone who's worked on an Ember app that's had more than like 10 files has probably chafed on this a little bit. Um, and then let's look at what happens when we create a new component. So uh, we're going to create what I'm sure is a component most of you have created uh, in your apps before. We're just going to create a, a component called Tom. So we'll run our generator in the command line. And in our beautiful new file system, this is going to give us uh, two files. Oh, well, actually, more than that, but I'm leaving the test out for the sake of illustration, because JavaScript developers don't like tests. Um, <laughs> so this is going to create a new directory called Tom, and it's going to put a component JavaScript file and a handlebars template in there, right in the right place in our file system for us. Now. Um, the Tom component is going to be responsible for drawing a really happy guy that looks like this. And we all know that the best way to put a vector illustration on the web is to do it in an SVG. So what we're going to do is we're going to fire up our favorite illustration tool, like Illustrator or Sketch. And we're going to draw our really happy and quite handsome looking guy uh, and export an SVG that looks you know, something like this, probably more or less XML namespaces, depending on what you're using. but you know. You get the idea. Now, it would be really great if we could take this SVG file that we've exported from our, our illustration tool and turn it into a reusable component that we can use all across our application. And I think what's really awesome about components in Ember is that templates are just HTML. And that means that we can copy the SVG that we generated in Sketch or Illustrator, and we can paste it into our components template, and it just works. And I think what's, what's really great about this and, and what's really important and something that's driven a lot of the thinking we've done in the design of these APIs is this makes Ember super accessible to designers, designers who can leverage the knowledge that they already have of HTML and CSS to make changes to your app themselves if they notice a bug instead of having to go you know, pounce on a software developer to write a PR because they don't know how to otherwise change the UI of this application. So OK, so, so far, this has been a really great experience. We've taken this SVG, we've copied and pasted it into our component, and it just works. So already, we're ahead of React. OK, great. So, <laughs> so we create this reusable component. We invoke it. We get a copy of our SVG illustration. We invoke it again. We get another copy of our illustration, add another one. We get another smiley face. You know, we just we really go to town. So the only problem is that this component is pretty static. And obviously, Tom is a very complex guy, a lot of different emotions, especially jet lag. Jet lag is an emotion, I've learned. So we want to add a little bit of interactivity to our component so we can dictate how it renders and how it behaves as we use it throughout our application. So we're going to do this by using an SVG element that maybe you've never seen before. Well, I should say I had never seen it before preparing for this talk. <laughs> so even though Animate Transform is maybe an esoteric part of the web platform, because Ember templates are just HTML, we can drop it in our template without worrying about whether it's going to work or not. 
We have that confidence. So now when we invoke the Tom component, we can tell Tom whether he has jet lag or not. It should probably be just is in Amsterdam. So I want to call your attention to this jet lag argument. So arguments in a Glimmer component are always prefixed with this at sign. And that's how you can tell them apart from a normal run-of-the-mill HTML attribute. So when we pass an argument to a component, that argument with the at sign is made available inside the component's template. So now we open back up our Tom template, and we can just drop in this animate transform element. And animate transform, this is just a, an element that, uh, it's, you can think of it like a CSS transition uh, or a CSS animation, but done in SVG in XML, HTML. So we drop it into this template, and say this conditional, and we're only going to add this, this DOM element actually into the DOM if the jet lag argument is true. So this works, actually. You can take this, it'll work just fine. But looking at this, it's almost doubling the size of this original template. And all of a sudden, the, the nice conciseness of it, the, where I could see what it was doing at a glance, it's starting to disappear, because we've almost doubled the size just to add this one animation. But fortunately, I think with Glimmer components make it really easy to quickly refactor out pieces of a template as it starts to get too big, as it starts to grow, and make it really easy to pull those pieces out into their own component. So what we're gonna do is take our animate, uh, our animate transform element out, and we're gonna create a new component called spin, or it's gonna copy and paste it literally no other changes to the code. So now if we go back to our original template, and we update it to, in that conditional, inside of that if, to invoke our spin component, rather than inlining that animate transform element just by itself. What's really nice about this, I think, at least when I look at this template, is not only does it make the template shorter, of course, I think it makes it a lot clearer and more expressive what's happening. We took this behavior that was wrapped up in that DOM element, and we've created a component and give it a name that gives it a lot more semantic meaning to how we're using it in this application. And so now when I read this template, I'm reading it like how I would think about it if jet lag starts spinning, a very relatable experience. So there's one more thing. We do have one problem, which is that this, uh, this illustration is obviously very beautiful, very handsome, very well dressed, <laughs> But it's not accessible for users who may be using an assistive technology, like a screen reader. So in this case, we want to add something like the aria label attribute, for example, which provides you know, a string label for our illustration that a screen reader can, can use to someone who uh, can read to someone who can't see it. So how do we make sure that the users of our component can add things like aria attributes? even if we never anticipated them. Even if someone's using our component in five years and they want to add, add an attribute or an ARIA attribute that we never even knew of when we wrote ours. So remember that arguments always have this at sign in front of them. And that means anything without the at sign is just a plain old HTML attribute. Now the only thing that we need to do in order to get this aria label attribute working on the component that we just wrote, is to tell Ember where in the components template we actually want those attributes to go. So we'll go back to our, <laughs> to our <laughs> this is so egotistical, we'll go back to our Tom template, and uh, at the root of our Tom template in the SVG element, we can add this dot 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 attribute syntax, or splattributes as we sometimes lovingly refer to it as. So, this dot, dot, dot attributes tells Ember where to put that aria label attribute or whatever other attributes whoever's invoking our component may have passed in. So now if we were to render this, if we were to run it and we were to go look in the DOM, we would see something like this, where the SVG's width and height, those attributes are being provided by the component template itself in the implementation of the component, 
But we are also getting this aria label attribute passed in by the invoker. And all of those attributes get merged seamlessly into this single element into the DOM. So that's a lot of new stuff to take in if you haven't looked at Glimmer components before. I think if there's one uh, takeaway I want you to remember about how Glimmer components work, the big change and why I'm so excited about this, this API and this way of building UIs over what we have today in the Ember component API is this. In a Glimmer component, the template is describing outer HTML. It's not describing the inner HTML inside this kind of implicit uh, div that you have to otherwise configure in your JavaScript. So one side effect of this is that there's no more auto-inserted IDs being generated, no auto-inserted Ember views. I don't know what your feelings of these are, but I know many people in writing their CSS prefer not to have all this stuff littering their DOM. Um, templates are fragments, and that means they allow multiple root elements, which means there's no need for the tag name empty string trick anymore, because in essence, every template, every component is tag name empty string. You can have one DOM node at the root, you can have 75 DOM nodes, you can have like 150,000 if you're running the LinkedIn test suite. Uh, <laughs> or you, you don't even need DOM nodes at all, I think is really incredible. You can just have a template that's just text, and just text nodes. Um, and I think this is really awesome, especially compared to uh, other solutions where you have to think really, really hard and carefully about how many things you're putting into your DOM, and a small change in, or what seems like a small change in your template can break everything. And in fact, the whole point, I think, for me, the thing that's so exciting about this is that we can finally say that when you're learning Ember, you never have to think about tag name or class name or class name bindings or attribute bindings or element ID ever again. You're welcome. So I think, I think all that's really exciting. But we, we haven't even talked about JavaScript yet. We've just been spending our whole, our whole, uh, all of our time together so far in, in templates. So well, what does this mean for JavaScript? What does the JavaScript side look like? Well, most of you are probably already using native JavaScript module syntax in your applications. You probably have something like this uh, where you're importing code from Ember or, or other libraries. But in the future, in the not too distant future, you'll also be able to use native JavaScript classes too, for example. So this whole world has a lot of stuff to talk about it in it, uh, but unfortunately my slot's only 30 minutes, so I've only got like an hour or two to, to talk to you. Um, but in the interest of time, there is one specific thing I want to spend some time going into. And that's uh, telling you about tracked properties and why I'm so excited about them. So tracked properties is a feature that we uh, first prototyped and built out in Glimmer.js, and now we actually have an implementation of these uh, behind a feature flag in, in Ember. We're just waiting for Chad to write the RFC, and Chad is waiting for me to help write the RFC. So, um, but I think, I, I'm hoping what I can do is kind of paint a picture of what tracked properties gets us, and I hope once we're through that, you'll be as, as excited as, as I am about them. So in order, I think, to understand the, the benefit and what's so exciting about tracked properties, we need to first compare it to something that I'm sure many of you have seen before. This has been in the documentation since like 2000, uh, actually 2008, because this was the Sprout Core example too. Um, so this is a classic example of a computed property where we define this person class and we also define a computed property called full name. So whenever, this, what this is saying is whenever first name or last name changes, we wanna recompute this full name property and if it's being used in a template in the DOM, make sure the DOM stays up to date. But there's a few problems with this if you're new to Ember, probably you know what I'm about to say. Maybe if you've been using Ember for a long enough time, you've actually forgotten and you've just really incorporated the, 
the, all the gotchas into your mental model and you don't hit them anymore. So computer properties like this, they have a few annoying um, properties. So first, people learning Ember tell us that this syntax is just not very intuitive. You have to read the Ember documentation to really understand what's going on here, and you have to just spend a little bit of time memorizing what the syntax is, what the behavior is, what order the, the arguments go in, and so on. Um, you know, it's, it's, you have to memorize a lot of stuff when you're a programmer, so you know, it's just one more thing on the pile, and I guess it's not that bad in theory. But if that's something that we could eliminate and get something that's just a little bit more intuitive for someone coming to Ember who's never used it before, that would be all the better. The second thing is that people just get really annoyed that they have to duplicate every property that they use in the function as a dependency, as a string. So, you know, I believe that explicit APIs oftentimes lead to, to clearer code, but in this case, there's nothing, there's nothing clearer about this. You have to repeat first name and last name, even though it's right there. You're repeating it not to help you, not to help the clarity of the code or to help your teammate understand the code better. You're repeating it for Ember, not for you. The third thing is computed properties cache by default, which is, uh, you know, I think, well, that's a well-motivated decision, but it can be really confusing to new learners. So if they're reading the documentation, I mean, First of all, if they read the documentation, okay, then let's say they read the documentation and they miss that small little detail that computer properties are cached by default or maybe they don't even just understand really crisply when that cache gets invalidated, then they're gonna take a look at this function and it's gonna be running really unpredictably. If they put a debugger there, they won't be able to anticipate when does it run, when doesn't it run, and it makes, them, it, makes it really difficult for them to build a mental model of, of Ember and how it works. So. This is a problem because in essence, we take every computer property and we make it one of the hardest problems in computer science. Come on. <laughs> Last and worst of all, it's really easy for the implementation and this list of dependencies to fall out of sync over time, particularly in larger or more complicated computer properties or when you're refactoring another part of the code and all the dependencies that you access change. And in those cases, what's really bad about this is it's not even like you get an error. You just have a template that sometimes doesn't update, and that's really hard to detect, and it can be really frustrating to debug if you even happen to notice it at all. So let's look at how we might write the same example but using tracked properties. So tracked properties, uh, by the way, you're probably gonna see the syntax that you're not familiar with unless you spend a lot of time reading ES discussed mailing lists. Uh, Track properties use a proposed new JavaScript language feature called decorators. So I think the way that I would think about decorators is that they're just a really nice syntax. Like syntactically, they're, they're nice and clear and they don't have a lot of extra verbosity. And they let you uh, tell a framework, like Ember or a lot of other libraries, that you can add special behavior to a particular class. So, in this line, for example, uh, that we've highlighted here, in this line on our person class, we're saying use the tracked decorator to tell Ember that we're expecting that this first name property might change. And then for our computer property, notice the syntax change here. We're no longer using this unfamiliar syntax that we've invented. Instead, we're using a bog standard JavaScript getter that you would learn about if you were taking a bootcamp class in JavaScript, for example. And we're using that getter syntax to write this little function that's gonna compute our, our full name string. The only difference is that, like before, uh, above for a first name, we're adding this tracked decorator. And that tells Ember, hey, I'm expecting as a programmer, this property may change over the life of my application, so make sure you're watching it, and if it does change, or any of its dependencies change, make sure you go and update the DOM. So maybe this doesn't seem like that big of an improvement over computer properties. You know, you already know the syntax. You're like, well, you know, sunk cost. I already know the syntax and all you're doing is changing it. And it doesn't seem like that big of a benefit for you to move my cheese. But I think 
I think just by itself, just this shows a lot of improvement and a lot, and a lot of important benefits. But I think it goes even deeper than that. So the first thing is it means that we can get rid of the requirement to use this dot set for property changes, right? Which is, which is really nice. You don't have to learn this set method. You can just write normal JavaScript. It also means that track properties just work with any, <laughs> I'm so sorry, uh, with any language feature now or in the future. So for example, you can use you know, plus plus to increment uh, an integer. That just works with properties and it just works with track properties. It's not something that would work with having to call set or set state or any kind of method that you need to call it in order to introduce a change into the component. But even as cool as this is, there's still, I think, an even more important reason to like track properties. Okay, so yeah, it wouldn't be a JavaScript conference if we didn't have to do MVC. So note this particular feature. Um, when all the to-do items are marked completed, this checkbox at the top of the column lights up. You see that? See that one more time. So you click, you're like, I'm gonna do some FRP, boom, click both of these, and then as soon as all of the to-dos are completed, this checkbox up in the corner lights up. So the way that this is implemented in the Ember version of Todo MVC is via a computer property, as you might expect. So the problem is that now we need to tell Ember that this computer property has a dependency not just on this to-dos array and the, and the items inside that array, but a property on every object inside that array. And this leads us to the dreaded at each syntax, which is really strange to new learners and still really confusing even to people who've been writing Ember for a long time. And God help you if you have an array inside an array, as I'm sure probably many of you have been around long enough have noticed, you can't have more than one at each in dependencies. So what do you do then? Well, you become a farmer, you just stop, you give up. <laughs> So it's, it, it's over, your career's over. Well, what if you didn't have to become a farmer, even though it is a very relaxing pastime? Well, this is how you would implement the same thing with track properties. So as you can see, you don't really have to think about your dependencies as much, and you don't have to figure out how to put them into the, the weird Ember string format that sometimes means magical things and sometimes doesn't. You just grab what you need off the to-do object, and our system can tell what you used while we're evaluating your computer property, and essentially we're doing the work for you. This could be machine learning. We don't know. <laughs> so we spent some time talking about the template side, the Glimmer and Glimmer VM, and obviously I'm really excited about that, and I think that delivers some really amazing usability, ergonomic, learning improvements. Uh, by the way, I was, there's also a bunch of performance improvements, but I was told I spent too much time talking about performance last year, so now I'm trying to talk about productivity. So you're welcome. Um, so on the JavaScript side, I think there's so much cool stuff coming, so much stuff that is only in the language because folks like Yehuda back in the day noticed that TC39 only had computer science PhDs and browser vendors on it and said, this, this is not producing good outcomes. We need people who are actually writing web apps on the committee, on these standards bodies. And now that is bearing fruit. Now we have things like classes and modules and almost decorators. And, and I think that this is so cool. This is like the, the vision of Ember from 2011 coming to fruition, coming true, except instead of having to build it into the framework, now it's built into the language and built into the browser and we get to share it with everybody and I think that's really exciting. Um, so JavaScript modules, JavaScript classes, and of course track properties, which give you this really nice terse native syntax by relying on decorators. You get auto track dependencies, which is just uh, so nice. And of course, no more at each. You're welcome. So what I hope you take away from all this, looking at, at these examples, looking at this code, is that despite Ember predating many of the JavaScript features, for example, that you saw here today, 
despite predating most popular libraries, most of the ecosystem, Ember today is a quintessentially modern framework. We've taken the time to adopt all these new features as they've rolled out to browsers, but we've done it thoughtfully. And we've done it in a way that ensures that we can bring this wonderful community of existing apps along with us into the future. And we don't have to just leave people by the wayside. So the question is, when we have something that, to me anyway, looking at these examples, it feels like an entirely new framework. When, so when, when will all of these features be ready to use together? Uh, how do we share this awesome experience once everything's in with the rest of the world? And how will people know that Ember isn't the Ember that they saw if they checked us out a few years ago? So this is exactly the problem that we are trying to solve with the, uh, by introducing the idea of additions into the Ember release process. Has, has anyone seen the RFC for additions? Have any? Okay, great. So, I mean, obviously, like some of the hardcore people are here. Um, so, <laughs> additions is this idea that we can, disconnected from the semantic versioning and disconnected from exactly what features are, are in or removed at any particular time, at any given time, I'd, the core teams are working on a set of improvements to the framework that I think really only makes sense together. Right? We have this coherence problem, which is that we are really strong believers in doing things incrementally, getting things landed, stabilizing them, doing them behind feature flags. I think every time we try to do a big bang anything, <laughs> it's taken five years. Writable components, though, next year, it definitely happened for you. Um, <laughs> I mean, maybe, right? At some point, even a stuck clock is, wrong, is right. Uh, so additions give us a way of communicating to each other, to the community, to the world at large, that the set of features that we've been working on, maybe each, any one behind the feature flag didn't really make much sense by itself. It didn't really seem to, to move the needle at all. But then I hope once you see all of this stuff that we've been working on for the last year or longer, come together and be part of this holistic picture and this fundamental change in how we think about and how we use Ember, I think that, that stuff adds up in a way that the, the, these changes to the programming model become greater than the sum of their parts. And so additions is a way for us to bundle up and polish those new features and, and polish that new programming model and present it to the world. So we're planning to call the first edition of Ember, Ember Octane. And if everything goes to plan, Octane will include all the features that we talked about today, and hopefully many more. And hopefully by seeing all of that together, you kind of got, you know, this light bulb went off. And that stuff working together is a really great opportunity, a really great time for us to overhaul our documentation, make sure everything's cohesive, that it's all aligned with this new programming model and to do things like refresh the website. Uh, you know, probably you know, eight years is a good time to uh, refresh uh, the website. Uh, and incorporate all of these dramatic improvements. So taking all this together, putting a new spin and a new uh, fresh uh, coat of paint on Ember, and giving the world a reason to take another look. So Adoption and, and growing our community is absolutely key for both the long-term health of Ember, but also to the apps that you've built on Ember. I'm sure you want to have an easier time hiring people. I'm sure you want to make sure that your apps are going to be around for a long time as well. So we need to make sure that the folks who are trying Ember, giving it a try for the first time, that they're finding it so productive that they, they can't, they're the annoying person who comes to work on a Monday and they can't stop telling their coworkers about what a great experience they had with Ember. And we need your help to make that happen. So personally, I think that Ember's embrace of HTML and CSS makes it particularly well suited to people who may not fit the mold of the typical, stereotypical JavaScript developer. People, who, people like web designers, for example, who they would prefer to fix HTML and CSS bugs that they see themselves than have to track down an engineer to fix the JSX to submit a pull request for them. Or UX developers who, you know, they know how to code, they have the skills, but maybe they're more interested in building prototypes like with awesome UI than managing application state with thunks or whatever. <laughs> that was a deep cut, thank you. 
Uh, and we also want to make sure that someone who's playing around with Ember can build something awesome over the weekend. Ember should be the number one framework for someone who wants to just build a real app over the weekend and doesn't want to spend it configuring Webpack. <laughs> so here's the, here's the ask I have for you. If you have a friend or a colleague who matches this description, have them try Ember. Have them try out some of these new features and get their feedback, like what works for them, what doesn't, what are they confused by, what makes intuitive sense, and let us know. Post on, on the discourse forums, say something in a Discord channel. Just try it out and experiment and see what resonates and what doesn't, because reaching these people, I think, is really key to the growth and the health of our community over the next few years. And if you work on a side project, nights and weekends, if you don't use Ember for that, think about why not, and then tell me, because I think, again, if anyone in this community wants to just do something cool over the weekend, spit up a little app, and for whatever reason you're not using Ember, that's a really bad sign. We need to be really great for people who just want to get something up and running and with great quality as fast as possible without wasting a lot of time. So that said, I think the future is awesome. There's this energy and this, uh, this just vibrant buzz in the community that, I don't know, I guess I haven't really felt it as much in the last few years as I do this year. It really feels like we've hit our stride and the momentum of, of this community and all the core teams has just been at a level I've never seen before. It's been really humbling to watch and really exciting to watch. And going back, doing this deck and putting all these pieces together was really eye-opening even for me to see it all work together. So I certainly hope you're as excited as I am. Uh, and thank you, and please send help.